I have some family secrets to tell, but first, I need to make one thing crystal clear. With two glaring exceptions, my mother is a true southern lady of infinite grace and discriminating taste. The first exception, and by far the least, is the fact that as soon as the four of us girls were safely on our own, Mama moved to a double wide in Clearwater, Florida, where in short order she married, then buried, two diamonds in the rough who smoked cigars. Good men, but phew. Only recently did she find the second great love of her life besides Daddy, retired Rabbi David Rabinowitz, who loves her back just as much as our sainted Daddy did. The second and worst exception is that Mama, who hated being named Daisy, broke her own vow to give her daughters normal names and succumbed to the centuries-old tradition of christening all female descendants of our direct ancestor, Lady Rose Hamilton, with floral names. Mama said she wasn't afraid of the ancient, unlucky-in-love curse that's supposed to fall on non-floral daughters, but Daddy, romantic that he was, loved the idea of siring his own little bouquet. So Mama finally gave in, sparing herself the infamy of breaking the chain of ages. Her only rebellion was naming me, the firstborn girl, Dahlia, instead of Rose. Frankly, I would have preferred Rose. Weird names like mine made me fair game for the Susans and Patricias and Nancys and Cathys of my era. Not to mention the fact that I still have to spell out Dahlia for everybody. I was unlucky in love, too, so maybe there's something to that curse after all. Two years after I was born, feisty, colicky Iris arrived. After another two years, we were blessed with precious Violet, an angel child from her first breath. I was eight before placid baby Rose was born, and Mama made her nod to the woman who started the whole tradition back in England. We've forgiven Mama for our names, but Mama hasn't been able to forgive our grandmother for her shortcomings, which were many, as you shall see. My three sisters and I had the privilege of growing up in Atlanta during that golden illusion of domestic innocence between World War II and the 60s. For us, magic was real and had a name, Lake Clare. We didn't know and didn't care that the lake was old Atlanta's premier summer watering hole, its rustic homes handed down from generation to generation, among them our great-grandparents' impressive three-story hilltop lodge and Mama's tiny cardinal cottage. We only knew we loved spending our summers in the little log cabin just down the hill, from our beloved great-grandmother and our black sheep grandmother, Sissy, short for Narcissus, who was so vain she never let anybody, even Mama, call her anything but Sissy. We never suspected how much Mama hated it at the lake, or why. All we knew was that there, in the cool beauty of the mountains, we could go barefoot, drink cafe au lait instead of milk with our eggs and bacon, and spend our days swimming and exploring and playing, and in Iris's in my case, fighting. We were so busy we never suspected the secrets that hid in the shadows of Hilltop. The last time my sister Violet and I saw Sissy was two years ago, and she was trying to kill us and enjoying herself immensely. But that was Sissy for you. She never had been anybody's idea of a grandmother. Or a mother, for that matter. It was just before Christmas, and Violet and I were on our regular holiday run up to Lake Clare, bearing gifts in a perky little decorated tree, along with the food we and my other two sisters took turns delivering every month. Normally, Violet and I really look forward to our December drive from her place in Clarksville to the northeast corner of the state. We both love the bare-bone splendor of the mountains in winter, and the trip provided welcome escape from the pressures of the season and a chance to visit. But this time, an unexpected Canadian clipper had barreled down on us, sending the temperature plunging into the cold, hard drizzle. By the time I picked her up and got back onto Highway 441, the bank of Habersham sign said 31 degrees, and the pine trees were already bowing slightly under a coating of freezing rain. It took a lot more than the prospect of running off the road to ruffle Violet. Of the four of us Barrett sisters, she was the most stable and well-rounded. 
Oh, gosh. Violet delved into her huge purse. I almost forgot to call Sissy. We were nearing the fringes of the cellular network, and it wouldn't do to arrive unannounced in our grandmother's isolated mountain realm. Even when we called ahead, there was no guarantee what we'd find when we got there. After dialing, Violet stuck a finger in her ear. We all have mid-range nerve deafness and waited, then hollered, Sissy? Hello, Sissy! She frowned at the phone and muttered, Still plenty of signals, she just hung up. Our grandmother Sissy was almost as hard of hearing as she was crazy, so even the special amplified phone we'd gotten her didn't make communicating much easier. You have to pay attention to the other person for it to help, something Sissy never had mastered. Violet dialed again, waited, then hollered hello again. After a brief pause, she brightened. Hi, it's Violet. We're on our way with your groceries. Pause. Violet, your granddaughter. Her soft alto voice wasn't made for yelling. No, Daisy is my mother. I'm Violet. She gave the thumbs up. Sissy had remembered Mama, at least, but she crossed her eyes at me when she did it, which made me laugh. Dahlia and I have your groceries. Pause. Dahlia, your granddaughter Dahlia were coming with the groceries. A sigh of resignation and renewed volume. We're on our way with the groceries. Your groceries are coming today. Her lips folded briefly. No, we're bringing groceries to you. The routine was so familiar I could hardly keep my tickle box from tumping over, which would only set Violet off, too. Beside the road, pine saplings were bent double now. I gripped the steering wheel. Let's get her the food and get back home ASAP. Works for me, Violet said.